Today's guest is Jackson Dreyer, an artist based in Nashville. Jackson's smooth tones have helped him bring in hundreds of thousands of Spotify streams and become an artist to watch. Welcome, Jackson. Thank you very much. That was, I'm flattered. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, of course. Happy to have you here. Absolutely. So let's start back at the beginning. Where were you born and raised and how did music first come into your life? Yeah, man. I was born outskirts of Chicago, northern suburbs, and none of my family is musical, which it's kind of crazy that that's not uh, common for musicians just because that's all I knew. So I'll meet people who are mu musical and they're like, yeah, I'll just jam with my family. That is not something that happened in my household. So I got introduced to music um, because I was I was uh, in school and we had like a recorder. Actually, I think I still have the recorder right over there. Oh, awesome. but, uh, but I was introduced to music through recorder and I was like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. And like got a recorder solo. I think it was like third grade or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, like hot grass buns and stuff wasn't what I was listening to. You know, I was listening to my dad's classic rock and, uh, and all that. So slowly transitioned into discovering stuff for myself. I started playing guitar, uh, when I heard Santana for the first time, I don't know if you're a Santana guy, but yeah, man, he is, you know, just, just the way that he's not like a shredder. He just kind of sings through the guitar. And that's something that I really connected to. And then, uh, similarly i started playing saxophone after i heard kenny g the first time so i'm i'm a big kenny g guy people give him crap and i i think that's totally unfair so uh so i started playing saxophone he's also you know just really great at melodies and that's something that stuck with me for a long time awesome when did you start writing your own songs that was like end of senior year of high school uh i wrote a song about my prom date Cause I was, I was like, I was interested, but she was kind of like, nah, man. So then, so then boom, we had something angsty with love that I could write about. And, and I wrote that and then moved to Nashville not very long after and realized that that song was pretty terrible, but <laughs> that I had potential. So kept writing after that. And obviously being in Nashville has been crazy for my development over the past six years now, I think. I think I've wow. been six years. That's amazing. So yeah, let's take it back a little bit. Um, what were some, who are some of the artists that you grew that you listened to when growing up? Like who were your influences at first? Yeah, absolutely. So my dad was big into classic rock and he kind of, you know, he'd, he'd have the radio station on or, or throwing records on. He also really liked Johnny Cash. So, you know, the Folsom Prison album and American Four, where he does the, the Nine Inch Nails cover of Hurt, like, well, sorry, Nine Inch Nails covered Hurt. Um, but Nine Inch Nails definitely... I got that mixed up. Anyways, hurt like things like that. It's so like Johnny Cash, classic rock were really big for us. I'm also a big Chicago fan. I don't know if you like Chicago, mm. but I have a bunch of Chicago records up on the wall. And this this uh, chair is actually owned by the trombonist at first. And I kind of happened across it. It was a total God thing. But uh, yeah, man, a lot, a lot of classic rock. So Chicago was a big one where it finally clicked. And I've seen them live three times and they have a horn section, you know, trumpet, uh, saxophone and trombone. And that is what inspired me to use a lot of horns in my own in my own show. Obviously, it helped that I played saxophone. So any horns that you hear on my records, I actually arrange those myself um, and I'll go through and like some music software and and get it down. And then we'll go through and record with real horns. Um, so that's, that's been really fun because that translates to the live show really well, where I'll have a trumpet and a saxophone up on stage with me and we'll just be having a blast. Uh, one of my favorite moments of, of the show is we used to cover that girl by Justin Timberlake. And, um, I had my sax saxophonist, Micah Holman, uh, write out like a horn, uh, uh, solely. So I was up at center mic singing and then my trumpet player, Rob Fay handed me my saxophone. And then the three of us played this like horn breakdown into the center mic. And that's forever my favorite moment from a show. Obviously we're going to try to top it once, once uh, uh, COVID allows us to do shows, but man, that, those are just fun memories that I've been like holding on to the past year, just waiting to get back to shows. Yeah, I bet. I mean, that's kind of what you have to do. You kind of have to, you know, hold on to the past and look forward <laughs> to the future while COVID shut everything down. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like how much do I want to look at photos and videos from from, you know, live music? It's like it's like you probably shouldn't look at photos like that. Like you shouldn't look at photos from someone you dated. 
You know, it's like, it's yeah, probably yeah. not best for your heart to be thinking about shows yeah. a lot. It'll, it'll <laughs> happen someday. There's other shows out in the sea. <laughs> That's hilarious. So true, though. Um, so, yeah, speaking of performances, did you perform at all when you were growing up, like after you started learning guitar and saxophone between then and when you started writing songs, like any performances yeah. between then? A little bit, like tiny, tiny things. Um, honestly, the recorder one was it was a big moment. You know, uh, I got singled out and I had to play play the, the recorder in front of everybody uh, at this school. And then jazz band in middle school is where it really clicked. And that's when I was getting into Santana. So like I would play Oye, Oye Como Va like seven times a day. And my parents probably hated me for it. Um, but they, they were very, very supportive of my music. Um, so, you know, those little jazz band performances here and there. I didn't sing though until high school and I was still very ashamed of singing. There was some weird like mental insecurity thing that I had going on where I was afraid to sing, especially in front of my parents. Um, so I probably sang in public, I think four times throughout high school. And then at the very end, I was realizing like, if I'm about to move to Nashville, like I got to get more okay with singing in front of people. And and now I'm totally cool singing in front of my parents and all that. But that took years for some reason. Um, I had a blues band in high school that I was a part of. Started out as a saxophonist in that. And then they were like, oh, he can play guitar too. And then you're like, oh, he can sing too. So, and, th and then we actually performed for, at my graduation party. We performed the song, the first song that I wrote that was about my prom date. And it was, man, what a moment. I think she was, wow. I think she was listening, if I remember correctly. And I'm like, well, this is about you. All right, here we go. <laughs> what, a, what a moment. I haven't thought about that in like probably, you know, six years or something. So yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, so, yeah, you, you mentioned you moved to Nashville, like around that time of high school. Um, what was the thought process going into that? Like what was um, what led you to moving to Nashville? And was it like a single moment where it clicked you want to be an artist? Or is it kind of just like a gradual thing over your life that it started to form for you that that was what you wanted to do? Yeah. So I'll kind of take that two part because the, the first one is kind of how I realized that, that I wanted to be an artist is I think I always wanted to be the front man and the guy that's up on stage and like kind of commanding the room and interacting with people the most. Um, but I really loved Santana and another guitarist named Joe Satriani. And so I just assumed that I'd be able to have a career like they did where they just got famous and, and successful just playing guitar. And then my dad was like, Hey, by the way, you kind of need to sing if you want to be a front man. Like there's way more singers that are front men than just guitarists. That's why Santana is kind of the only one. Right. So then it clicked that I had to sing. And then as that progressed, it clicked that I had to write songs as well in singing and writing songs were things that I did not enjoy when I started them. But I, but I figured that, as I learned more about them and did them more, I would learn to love it. Kind of like how, you know, like I, I never really liked basketball and, or golf until I understood the intricacies of it. And then I fell in love with that process and how it actually worked. So that's how it was for seeing guitar for me is at first I was like, I don't like this. I'm bad at it, Ugh. but I stuck it through. And now they're two of my favorite things. Um, so that's kind of how I realized that what being an artist was, because I never thought about, you know, artist writer was the goal I just wanted to make music and now I love the music that I do and it just so happens that that fits in the bill of I'm an artist and I'm putting out my own music and having shows and things like that um and I already forgot the first part of the question yeah was, so what took you so once you decided to be an artist what took you to Nashville how'd I get to Nashville there it is thank you yeah um it was it was a god thing uh totally I had, I, I didn't know what Nashville was. I might have heard about it and just pictured straw ha cowboy hats and, you know, p piles of cow dung and all that. Like, I, you know, I didn't know what it was one bit. And then in, I think it's summer after my freshman year of high school, I went to this Christian summer music camp and uh, played guitar. And there was this instructor there who, who said, I studied this at Belmont and I have this little green notebook still where I wrote down you know, three and a half years prior to me end up doing it, uh, my exact major and the intricacies of my degree pretty much. So then from then on, it was the only place that I looked at, only place I applied, you know, had to audition for the music program and all that. So uh, 
came for college and then, you know, it, it's never felt, um, it, it's, it's never felt unnatural. This place felt like home as soon as I arrived in town. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of wild. It was very, it was very prophetic how that ended up. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm chilling, I'm enjoying life in Nashville and we'll see if God tells me to go somewhere else. And, you know, hopefully I listen. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so what makes it feel like home for you? What are those aspects? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of wonderful things about Nashville. Um, first of all, I just love where I live in town. I live in a part of town that's still close to downtown, but it's like, it's very neighborhoody. And a lot of my neighbors are, um, a lot older. So yeah, they're, they're adorable. You know, we might say hi and like wave from our driveways and like, I love that kind of stuff. Um, it's just a really great town for food. Um, obviously music is here, so that's, what's allowing me to stay here, but the community has been awesome to me. Uh, and I feel like I've always been someone who, touches around a lot of different communities. So, you know, I got my church community. I do work with people of in Nashville and we serve people experiencing homelessness. So those are the people that I see mostly, you know, all throughout the pandemic too, I've still been uh, heavily involved in that. So great community there. And then there's obviously the music community and I have people in the songwriting world that I hang out with, but then also like, I'm still a musician enough to where I can hang and jam with people who are just musicians who, who don't sing or write songs at all. Um, so, you know, there's late night jam spots that I'll go to where I get to feel like I don't need to worry about singing or being an artist or any of like the, the muck and mire of the industry side of things. I'm like, we're just going to jam. We're going to hang out and enjoy life. So there's, there's a lot of good community here. And then, um, yeah, you know, it's good. Yeah. It's, only like, it's only an eight hour drive from Chicago too. So that's, that makes home not feel terribly far away you know it's not like i'm in la and having to get back to chicago yeah for sure like it's still accessible yeah um so what were what was your first experience like when you first moved to nashville um was it hard for you was it easy um kind of walk us through what is first like first getting there yeah absolutely um i'm a big john mayer fan by the way uh and i remember before i went to college i was listening to a talk that he did at oxford university and he mentioned that uh anytime you do something big or have a big move or make, make, you know, a big shift in life, you're going to have like a freak out moment and, uh, and be like, why am I doing this? Am I good enough? What's going on? Right. So I moved to Nashville and I was like bracing for a freak out moment of, of, you know, am I actually good enough? There are these dreams crazy, all that kind of stuff. But I think the people here just welcomed me so good. I was so at peace with it. I have yet to have a freak out moment about the move, about the music, about my life trajectory. And I think that's a testament to the people here and a testament to my family being so supportive and my faith that God's just like, I got you, dude, you know, I'm going before you. So like, I don't, I don't need to worry about it. You know, there's still like really tough times and, and all that, but, uh, but overall, you know, it, it's, it's been a very comfortable transition and I got to jump right into things you know, of course I did all the standard touristy things when I first got to town and, and now I'm, I feel a little bit like a gatekeeper. I'm like, Oh no, I'm, I'm basically a local now, but I've only been here for six years, you know, but, but yeah. I feel like I've, I've, I've paid my dues a little bit in this town. Yeah. It's awesome. It seems like you, you know, found the right place for sure. Um, so your experience, your experience at Belmont, tell us more about that. And like, what did you feel, what do you feel you got the most out of your time at Belmont? Yeah, man. Oh man. So I, I, I called it like, I, I'd, tr I'd try to mooch off of people and organizations and classes and things like that. Cause like, I never wanted to just go and be like, I'm just studying guitar and that's all I focus on, or I'm just focusing on this. Um, I really, really cast a wide net while I was there. So started out as a guitar major, but that was when I was starting to realize that I was a songwriter and that I really loved doing that. So you know, I would go into these guitar lessons and the guitar teachers are very much like, I'm a jazz teacher. We're going to do all these drills and you're going to practice a lot and all that kind of stuff. And I'd get back to my dorm and I'd pick up my guitar and I'd be like, okay, I'm going to work on this today. And then I just write a song and then three hours would pass and I would have no time to practice. And then the next day would come and, you know, they'd be like, how'd practice go? I'm like, I wrote a song. You know, so, so I was still picking up the guitar stuff, but really growing as a songwriter. And then at the time my voice really sucked. 
So I joined an acapella group that thankfully let me join. And then I was surrounded by these singers that were all way better than me. And I got to kind of pick up their technique and how they were doing things and just, you know, the act of singing a lot and making sure that I was singing healthily made my voice a lot stronger naturally. So I was doing that. Then I like, you know, took a random arranging class and songwriting classes, things that I don't think I was really like supposed to take because they didn't help my major. But I was just like, I just want to learn everything. I want to do this. I joined a fraternity while I was there, which was very much not a music major thing to do. But I just wanted to meet people, you know, and, and, th and those relationships have continued to pop up throughout life. So I just cast a really wide net because, you know, if we're spending that kind of money, like I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to milk that school dry pretty much is, was was my uh, was my, my way of looking at it. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, I like we said about, you know, how you were, um, in your opinion, one of the least talented in that vocal group. Um, that's something that actually a lot of businessmen talk about, as I've been learning, is that they like to be, they like to surround themselves with people that know so much more than them so that they can learn. Yeah. And I feel like it can be so intimidating sometimes to put yourself in that position, but the payoff to yourself can be so huge, like you were saying. Absolutely. And I love, I love and hate, obviously, because I'm competitive, but I kind of love that I'm probably the, the, the worst musician in my band, you know, like I surround myself by these killers that I, I go to their shows just to watch them, you, you know, and, uh, and they're, they're the guys that play in my bands and on my records. And I just think that's so important because, you know, I'll, uh, I, I remember this one thing. I won't say the, the name of the video so people can't look it up and hear how bad it was, but it's still out there where we, we played this song and, and, and it was recorded, put on YouTube. And then I watched it after expecting to be like, Oh, I'm going to sound so good. And I had a come to Jesus moment about my own like timing and rhythm. And I was like really bad at it, but the rest of the band was rock solid. So I stuck out like a sore thumb and, uh, and I'm like, thank God that I have these awesome musicians around me. Grant, they probably should have said, Hey, you, you get with the metronome, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but it was great. You know, I like, I, I got to learn from them and, and, and be surrounded by them and watch what they do and the way they approach music. And I've grown in that way. So um, shout out to my band. They're awesome. Yeah, shout out to the band. That's that's amazing. <laughs> a great experience. And, you know, it's good to have those moments, those kind of come to Jesus moments, as you mentioned, where yeah. it's like you have to take a look at yourself and say, you know, what can I actually do better? Rather than thinking, you know, you're the hottest stuff all the time. I think it's important to be able to keep growing and be aware of yourself like that. Yeah, man. I call it an emotional checks and balances. Like we just, we got to get knocked down every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when did you start um, not only writing your songs, but then releasing those songs that you've written and like actually putting those down and recording them? Yeah, man. Oh, well, the funny thing is like first getting to the point where there's a song worth releasing. And there's a few th things that go into that. First of all, you got to be writing, you know, interesting enough lyrics. My lyrics have gotten better over the years of releasing. But the, the most important thing is finding the sound. And I think that's what it was like. It's kind of like if you know that there's gold like 50 meters down, you're going to have to get through a lot of really boring dirt and grass and clay and all that to get through. So I was going through the songs that I wrote at the beginning of college, probably about a month ago. And, and I, I went out onto my old college email, Google Drive, pulled up the lyric sheets. And I was like, I wrote these and like played them for people. Like <laughs> I was I was cackling, but like terrified at reading these lyrics that I'd write. But like, then I would remember, and I'd be like, actually, that little musical thing that I did ended up being something that even though the, the whole song was crap, like that little thing in the pre-chorus, that was good. And I discovered that and I, you know, kind of uncovered it, polished it off. And I was like, okay, we can, we can hold on to this as we continue to write songs. And uh, so I, I found my sound like sophomore year of college, I guess. So that was probably 2016 uh, 2015, 2016, kind of started to find my sound, started to realize that like, you know, all the Motown and, and Chicago that I listened to is really where I felt honest as, a, as an artist. Um, so then July 2017, I put out my first single and it was called Step Up, not to be confused with my, with my recent single called Step Back. So we, we might have to go a bunch of other different directions <laughs> in the future here, but that song, I, I still listen to it. Like, I don't, you know, I'm going to leave it up because I think it's a great testament of, of how far I've come. But the, so the sound of that song still 
clicks. It still works with what I'm doing today, which is crazy because the amount that I've grown as an artist, as a person, as a singer, you know, it, it, it's wild that that song still feels honest to what I do. Um, and, and, that, and that song kind of thematically was like step up, like I'm stepping up into this new, you know, kind of calling or new echelon of I'm an artist who releases music. And, you know, I didn't have to be like, I do music. I'm like, I'm an artist. Boom. Like, I want to do this thing. I want to continue to release records and, and do this for a long time. So I'm still proud of that song. And then, uh, you know, I had a couple other projects that led up to uh, my first like mini album, which was the self-titled one uh, that Can't Fake It's On. And that's the that's the song that's done the best um, uh, numbers wise, you know. Yeah. Uh, success is what you what you make of it but uh but yeah that that album was the first kind of big foray into into releasing and that was uh back in 2018 so that's crazy looking back on yeah oh i bet um <laughs> so what'd you do for recording for that for the first time you got into doing recording like did you produce yourself did you go with somebody to work with did you collaborate what was that like I've always surrounded myself with awesome producers and engineers that I'm just fortunate that they want to work with me. Um, So that first one, we actually used these free studios down underneath Belmont. And, uh, and I think I, it's so funny because I think I paid the engineer like 30 bucks, which uh, are like 20 or 30 bucks to do like two singles. And he was in the room with us for like a whole day Oh, no. <laughs> and I, was like, I have like 20 or 30 bucks is that cool so that I feel I feel kind of bad about that looking back now but uh but that was that was like the cheapest record I ever did I think um <laughs> but uh ended up bringing that to my buddy Dave Villa who's an amazing producer still and uh producer and writer and brought that song to him and he he mixed it and made it sound that way um and then the next project that we did they were called the cozy sessions and that was all one room. Like we actually didn't do any overdubs. Uh, we just set my whole band up in a circle and I had two cameramen kind of swinging around. I'm still super proud of those songs. They're, they're on YouTube. They're called the cozy sessions. Um, but that was all live in the room. And then the next project we, uh, we did the, uh, the album, um, which was, we spent uh, several days, at this studio on music row with my buddy jared conrad who produced and engineered all that and i actually did like a fundraiser for like my first big project and uh and and people raised you know some really awesome uh uh, money for that and we made it happen um so that was sick that was that was like the most legit recording thing at that point um where it was still all live instruments horns drums you know guitars all that that's awesome is there a moment you can think of so far in your music career that you're most proud of? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, most proud of, I think it's, it's funny. Um, and this, this was, this was a ways back. This was, uh, I don't know, 2017, maybe 2018, but it's some, it's a show that will always stick in my mind. I don't know if it's the one that I'm most proud of, but I'm, I'm very proud of it. But I did this Disney cover show uh, that my buddy Tanner Asanero put together. He's 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 a he's a great artist, um, and 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 I think it it was it was a really fun time where I got to reimagine a number of Disney songs to fit my sound. So it was it was quite the undertaking because you know I had to chart everything out, write horn parts, reimagine things. Like for example, we did "Can You Feel the Love Tonight." Wow. And then we did it to the vibe of Versace on the floor by Bruno Mars. Oh man. <laughs> so, so my buddy Kevin Monahan on guitar, like he played the synth solo from Versace on the floor on his guitar over candy feel the love tonight. And like, it was just so much fun getting to reimagine those things and plug them into my sound, which to me showed that my, my sound is defined enough to the point where I can remix things to fit what I do, you know, just repackage, these great songs into 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 my my artist identity and, and sound and all that so that was really fun i've had some other things that i'm proud of uh since then but that that sticks out as like a really fun moment so far that's really interesting how you put it like that how you can tell that you found your sound because you can apply that to other artists um songs i guess that's that's actually really cool to hear 
Absolutely. And I, and I think that was something too, where I, where I realized like when I'd be writing for a record or writing just to get more songs in the vibe of what I was doing, I think, and, 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 and uh, this isn't to say that you can't use this technique ever, but I think early on, like in my infancy as a songwriter, I might listen to an Alan Stone song and then write a song that is very clearly a ripoff of said Alan Stone song or like, you know, where, where I could just listen back and I'd be like, oh, I was listening to Bob Marley that week, you know? Yeah. But there, there comes a point where you're able to still use this paint palette of all the artists who influenced you or the ones that are influencing you currently. But I still kind of channel my sound and I can write not thinking what would John Mayer do right here, but I'd be like, what am I doing here? You know, and there's a shift that occurs to the point. And I think that's where you really know that you've found your sound and, and, and it obviously develops and, and evolves as you work with new people and hear new things. But that was a big moment where I didn't feel like I was just going for rip off tracks. And I was actually like, what do I want to say? What do I want to sound like? What makes me happy? Um, because ultimately like if, if the stuff that I'm not putting out is exactly what I want to hear and, 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 and what I want to say, then I'm not doing it right. Yeah, that's a great point. I love that. I love that um, view on everything. It's it makes a ton of sense to me. Um, what are your goals for your music in the long term? What do you want to happen? That's a great question. Uh, I have some goals. I have some. They they definitely got a bit muddled up with the whole coronavirus thing, um, as has for everybody. But some of the goals, yeah, like one of the goals was to play at Live on the Green in 2020. Uh, which is this great um, festival in Nashville. And uh, they did not even have it this year, yeah, <laughs> this past year. So, uh, but that that's a goal for like the next Live on the Green. Like, I want to play that. Um, I mean, you know, I want to get some great opening slots. Uh, so I have, you know, actionable goals, you know, like I'm, I'm working on an album right now and slowly putting out songs. So there's those kind of short-term, long, you know, semi-long-term goals, but, I think the big thing is if people say like, what's the dream? I've never actually dreamt it, but if I were to kind of manufacture a, a dream for what I want my music to be is I just picture me on stage with a band and we're playing my songs and there are people in the audience. I don't know how big the venue is in this dream. It could be an arena. It could be the basement in Nashville, which is like 150 cap. I don't know what it is. But I'm but there people are singing my lyrics back to me and we're getting to play it. So like that that's the I guess that's the dream. That's the ultimate goal is just that because that that dream says a lot of things. It means that I'm releasing my own music. Uh, I'm getting to do it for a living and people like it. So cool. Like, you know, whatever trajectory that takes me on in terms of venue size and all that I'm down with. You know, I just want to be able to make music and enjoy it you know, eventually have a family, things like that. So I'm pretty open to the, to the, how all that comes about. Um, but that's, that's the goal. That's the dream right there. That's awesome. And yeah, it seems like you're on a good track so far. I mean, you've crossed a lot of steps to get there and I think it's just going to keep going up. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And, and there's a lot of, a lot of people that have, you know, definitely already been helping along the way. So I hope I'm able to keep working with a lot of these folks for years and years, you know, that'd be awesome. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so what advice would you give to artists who are still struggling to find their sound? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, just kind of back to the, to the mining example, like you just got to keep digging and, and, and writing songs and, and rocking with what you're inspired by. Um, I think there's also a thing where I, I didn't struggle with this a ton, but like a lot of people, when they move to Nashville, they go like, I guess I have to be country or they think they have to be country or whatever. So, if, if they're like, if you're an artist watching this, uh, scan yourself and say, is there something, is there an expectation that I have that's not from me that other people have placed on my, me or that I've placed on myself about what my music should sound like or what it should be doing, what the vibe, what the message should be. And just wash out all that stuff that's not totally honest because you're not going to write um, and, and make music that that actually works and is your sound until you're honest with yourself and there are plenty of people who even put out projects that they don't uh like like i literally have a i will not name them but this this person was telling me you know that they're putting out a project soon and they don't like any of it 
And I'm like, oh my gosh. And they're like, yeah, I'm still finding my sound. So like, it's not to say that you can't put music out that doesn't feel totally you. But once you start to find those songs that are totally you, like hold on to that and, and see what you did right. You know, was it, was it reading a book that made that that gave you ideas was it um just drawing on experiences in a really honest way where you're not trying to say what are people going to think about this and instead be like what am i currently feeling totally down to the bone what's honest um because it's it's a very easy cliche like um you know like people want to want to hear what like who who you are but so often we try to package us in a way that's not authentic but the best music is the most authentic. It's just, it's a struggle to actually be authentic. Um, there's, there's this ad that I get for like one of those masterclass things on YouTube all the time. And, it, and this guy always goes, write like nobody's watching because no one is. And I forget that because I'll literally be sitting on my bed trying to write a song and I'll be like scared to write a lyric or, or you know, like uh, open up about something. And I'm the only person in this house, you know, that, that, that can hear me. And, uh, and it's just crazy. So, so often we put up these walls and don't allow us to actually write what we're feeling, or maybe it's too edgy or whatever. And if it's too edgy, cool. You, you can still write it and not even worry about ever putting it out. But the fact that you wrote it and, and, and achieved a new level of depth in your, in your own writing is something that can be celebrated. And that's only going to benefit you in the long run. Yeah, I think that's 100% great advice. Um, I mean, even for me personally, it's like I can relate to that where it's like we put these blocks on ourselves to stop us from doing things, even though it's only us who is involved with it at that moment, you know. It's just insane what gets lost in that process because of ourselves. So it's kind of need to get our own way sometimes. But yeah, what are you excited for that's coming up? Oh, man. A uh, few months will be the NFL again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I get to golf more now that the weather's good. Uh, musically, man, I'm excited to get these singles out. We got we got a few more coming up. Um, each one's going to be awesome. And then and then there's going to be an album. Uh, I still don't have a total timetable for it. But with life's ebbs and flows these days, I'm, I'm trying to not you know be super strict about it, um, which maybe that's not a great call, but it's how I'm able to, you know, be a self perseverant you know uh so getting those getting those together i'm excited for when shows start to open up and i can put together a bill with some local artists that i love and just get back up there because i was thinking about it the other day like i think what i do best is performing on stage you know with with the band or or just myself or whatever and that's something that's been suppressed for over a year now you know, and, and, and I, and I miss that. And, and, it, and it feels, it feels rough because I'm good at a lot of things or, you know, at the, at these various things that I, you know, pour my time into, but I feel like I'm best at that. So I'm excited to get back to what I'm best at. And, uh, you know, I'm also excited just about different things that I'm working on that, that are continuing to grow. I'll, I'll plug people up in Nashville again. Um, it's this great organization, 501c3 that uh, works with folks experiencing homelessness and I do a lot of work with them and they're just doing incredible stuff, getting people off the streets into, you know, affordable housing, hotels, uh, things like that, clothes, food. Um, it, it's been really wonderful. So I'm excited to see how that continue to grow. And I want to pair that with my artistry as that grows too. Um, whether it's people of in Nashville or like my own organization someday. Um, so I'm excited about that. A lot to be excited for, man. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot of good in the world, you know, we Absolutely. just find it or make it. Yeah. I mean, 2020 is rough, but there's, you know, a lot more things coming up now and it's exciting to see it all open up. And I love what you're doing with the organization too, like helping people and wanting to combine that with the music. I think that's a very um, commendable goal. And I think you're going to do great things with it. I mean, you have a tight sound, you've got a vision for it, you know, it seems to know who you are or more so than you did before at least. And I see good things coming up for you. So I'm excited for you as well. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate that.